Hello everyone. Welcome back to the Doctor Will See You Now. If you are a subscriber, thank you so much for that. And if you are new to the channel, it's great to have you with us in the consultation room. Uh, a place where we get to know authors a little bit better. A place where we get a chance to talk about, usually about their latest work. Um, and the idea that we share the joy of some good crime fiction and we all know that that genre is so flexible uh, and so today's consultation well it's one of those moments with an author that the work I'm familiar with we've been in places together at the same time but we've never had a chance to do this and it always excites me to think chance for me to get to know you just that little bit better so it is with great pleasure that I welcome Mark Edwards into the consultation Mark it's lovely to have you here today thank you so much it's lovely to be here I'm slightly nervous oh please don't <laughs> be please don't be we're very gentle uh, in, you know in, in, in our uh, examination of both okay. you uh, uh, and your work uh, and we're here um to talk about well to talk about you but also to talk about um the dark conspiracy action mystery tale uh, as one reviewer called it no place to run uh published by thomas and mercer and it came out june 2021 That's uh right. so for us here today recently uh off the press uh, and, and, and many congratulations with this latest book, because I think you've done something different, uh, a little bit different from what you normally do. So I'm, I'm looking forward to asking you about those decisions and okay. the path that that means for you. For anybody not familiar with Mark and his work, he's a best-selling author of psychological thrillers, uh, four million books, and probably ticking over as we're talking. So how do you, you know, around the four million mark, I, yeah. I do believe, uh, since that first novel as a, uh, a sole author, The Magpies, uh, that was published in 2013. That's right. So nearly 10 years now. I know, yeah. yeah. It's the anniversary next, next March for The Magpies. Yeah, yeah. And, how do, uh, I'm gonna... Please, I'm yeah. Planning some I'm planning some celebrations for that um, when that happens. And it's actually 10, it's, a, it's 11 years already since the first book that I wrote with Louise Voss came out. So, yeah, I've been doing this for 11, 11 or 12 years published. And there was a long, long period before that as well, before I ever managed to get a book deal. So, yeah, I feel like I've been doing this a long time now. But but but, but Mark, there's there's a number of wonderful things in 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 that you know that opening introductory remark that you've given us. First of all, you know, the years published is wonderful, but but the mm. years that you write in before publication gives many a listener, many a viewer, the joy of thinking, okay, for some people it doesn't happen. Yeah. overnight it's not a guaranteed thing that my first piece of writing will you know will end up in no. waterstones wh smith's bestseller list times you know times crime yeah. um and and i think you know it's it's important that if you are a writer um please just keep doing it you know don't be defeated by the length of time it might take uh, and I just have to say um of course in Newcastle Noir and the idea of the magpies yeah. um, we're a little bit excited <laughs> about course. that we yeah. love that we will certainly be joining in that celebration uh, next year yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah um so but back to no place to run okay and I think you know I'd, I'd like to start by asking you it was a departure maybe to a certain extent from what you normally have written. I wonder if you could tell us why you decided to do this and what changes did you relish making? Okay, well, I think my books can be divided into two or three different types. You've got the more straightforward domestic thrillers or domestic noir as it's often called. So you've got the magpies because she loves me, 
here to stay. The ones that are generally set in a house in England somewhere with um, neighbours from hell or in-laws from hell or someone's home being in mm -hmm. invaded in some way. Um, then you've got the the more kind of spooky, um, not quite horror, but but using lots of horror tropes, the creepy woods books. So books like Follow You Home and The Retreat and and um, uh, The Hollows, generally set set in some woods somewhere in a cabin or in a house in the woods with with mysterious things going on in the in the trees or among the trees and then you've got the more action-based books so before this one there was uh, a book called the house guest which came out a couple of years ago which was the first one that i set in america and i would say follow you home as well which was my is actually my biggest selling book from 2015 there's lots of action elements in that. And it also starts on a train like this one does. So I had experience writing the more kind of action thriller before. And I, but kind of mixed with psychological thriller or domestic noir. And I thought for, for a change, I'm going to go all out with the Harlan Coben, Linwood Barclay, Lee, almost Lee Child-esque um action thriller with like the everyman hero and i suppose what sets it apart from something like lee child is that my main character my hero is just a kind of typical british bloke who's got absolutely no experience of any of the things that he's gonna find himself facing i suppose it's almost as if i was thrown into the situation what would i do so um the things that I relished about that is, I, I, the, I mean, the American setting for one thing kind of gives you that big canvas that you can that you mm. can paint the story upon. It feels, for some reason, it feels very different when you sit down to write a book set in America, especially kind of in the in the rural parts of America, and like the small towns and the forests and the deserts and so on. It just feels it feels different to sitting mm. down and writing a book set in London, for example. Um, there's more opportunity for people running around shooting each other. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, everyone's got, I mean, often British authors have to come up with quite creative ways of, of uh, killing characters off. I mean, the amount of people who've been pushed off of high buildings in my books or, um, have died in fires or drowned or um or or being buried or something whereas in with these books people tend to kind of get shot which is possibly less creative but it's it's easier <laughs> yeah and 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 you know and, and given you know recent headlines mm. you know and and it's not it's not unthinkable is it i mean that's that's the thing um you know that idea of if if it is. I mean, I have, I have a, a memory of of of, of living in in Oregon. Okay, yeah. Uh, and a and a friend saying, "I'm I'm going to go to one of the local large supermarkets and buy my husband a rifle yeah. for his birthday." Yeah. Well, we went to Walmart on this research trip. So so back in 2019, my friend Ed James, another author, and I. Yeah. Um, went to we went to Seattle then we caught the train that's in the book the coast starlight down to the very southern tip of Oregon Klamath or Klamath I'm not sure exactly how you pronounce it and then we drove into Northern California and we went to Walmart um, in Klamath and and yeah they've got all the they've got the guns and the bullets and the and all the all the like the gun owner magazines and and as Brits, it's just, it's, it's, it's kind of horrifying in a way mm. to see it. Mm -hmm. And obviously all the terrible things that have happened recently, like the, like the recent school shooting. I mean, I, I could say that probably at any point because there seems to be a school shooting every month or even, even more often, it's just horrendous. And, um, but as a, as a writer, 
Um, and as also as a kind of person who grew up liking action films and enjoying watching Arnold Schwarzenegger run around and Sylvester Stallone and, and so on, it's quite enjoyable in that total kind of totally fantastical way to, to have bad guys out in the woods with their, with their um, assault rifles guarding their compounds mm. and their, and their mm -hmm. farms and so on. And it just makes everything much more dangerous and much more high stakes. I, I'd like to, I like the comparison though that you draw, you know, between the idea of writing a novel set in London mm. with its dangers. Yeah. But how different they are. To, yeah. you know, to, to, to the idea, again, of, you know, that, that other setting and not even thinking about Seattle or Los Angeles, but thinking mm. about those wilder spaces. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's quite terrifying in a way to think of some of it about some of these places. And so in Northern California, you, so it's difficult for me to talk about some of this without veering into spoiler territory so I have to be kind of careful what I say but um part the book is partly set in what's called the Emerald Triangle which is where all the cannabis is grown in California and those places have some of the highest incidences of people going missing mm -hmm. disappearances people trafficking um all of these kind of teenagers or young people they they want to go and work in the cannabis industry they think it's going to be really glamorous or cool or whatever and even since it's been legalized there's still these these um illegal grows going on it's not kind of like run by peace and love hippies like it was in the 60s anymore it's it's massive business and there are parts of Northern California where the police are scared to go because, mm. because they're, they're these remote kind of mountains and, and dark corners of the forest, they're guarded by these, these scary guys on quad bikes with assault rifles. And, and if you trespass on their land, then you're going to get shot. And so, and part of the book kind of leads into that area of, of California. If, if someone watching this is interested in that world, there's a really good documentary series on Netflix called Murder Mountain. Um, and yeah, I I kind of set part of this book in a fictionalized. Mm -hmm. I actually I'm gonna, changed. I'm going to make a note of that. Name. Murder Mountain. It's Murder Mountain good. on Netflix. Yeah. 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 Um, but I actually, because I, when, I, when I wrote the first draft of the book, I used all the real town names of all the places I was basing this on. And then at the end, I changed, <laughs> changed them because <laughs> I thought, what if somebody actually reads this who lives in one of those places who take great offence at my... <laughs> mm. Yes, and my, what, it, my what if there is not another, another Mark Edwards book because of that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But no, it was... it's. Um, it is obviously there are kind of shadowy dark places in the UK as well, but they're much they're much easier to find, I think, in the US. As Aidan says in the book, it's the perfect country to go or a very easy country to go missing in. Yeah. yeah. America. Without without a doubt, without a doubt. Mm. So but let's start looking at these various different elements that that you've mentioned. Um so west coast rather than <clears throat> east coast yeah well the last two were set on the east coast mm -hmm. so house guests were set in new york um, and kind of around new york new york state and then the hollows were set in maine and um i think because i wanted to have the like the cannabis farms and also I, and the wildfires that's why it had to take place on the West Coast. I mean, it could have been... So the book, the seed of the book, the germ of the book came with the train journey. And I had this image, which came to me from, I don't know where, it just appeared to me, of a, of a young woman or a teenage girl being pursued across a forest clearing. 
Um, it was quite, when I first saw it, it was a little bit foggy. I wasn't sure if she was being chased by just one person or a group of people. I didn't know who she was or who the pursuers were. And I saw it as if I was on a train kind of looking through the window and, and seeing this girl being chased. And so I started the book with that image. And then I had to figure out who is she? What's the, is this a story? Is this a start of a book? And, and then worked it all out from there. And, mm. and I quickly decided that it was going to be in California, that it was going to be the, the coast starlight, which is the train that runs from Seattle all the way down to LA, the Amtrak train. And, um, and then the more, and then the, the, the other elements of the book, like the, like the environmental elements and the wildfires and so on, I came in a little bit later, but yeah, I, I, I started it as a, as a missing, missing persons thriller and decided that it was going to be somebody searching for this girl who'd been chased across the clearing. Mm -hmm. And then I had to figure it all out from there. So let's talk then about the missing girl. She's 15 year old Scarlett and yeah. she's from the UK. Yes. And she's gone to visit her brother, Aidan, uh, who's living in Seattle. Yes. There's 12 years difference as well between these siblings, which, yeah. which I found interesting. Yeah. The I have a sister who's 11 years younger than me, so I kind of drew from that. From that. OK. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and the idea of um, an Englishman abroad, uh, mm. the, the choice for it not to be you know, someone Seattle born and bred? Well, there are, there are practical answers. There are practical <laughs> reasons for that. One is that I didn't want to write like, the whole thing in American English. Mm -hmm. And um, partly because American and British English are so different. I mean, I, some of the chapters are written from the point of view of American characters, mm -hmm. which... I actually think I can do, but I didn't feel confident to write the whole book from the point of view of an American character. Um, so there's that. And I thought that my British readers um, would prefer something from the point of view of a British character, because still the, the majority of my audience are in, are in the UK. Okay. Uh -huh. So there are practical answers, not just artistic <laughs> answers to that but um also I really like the idea of being of my main character being a fish out of water mm -hmm. so I've written quite a lot of books where people go to other countries or places that they're not familiar with where you don't feel secure you don't know what to do if something goes wrong you don't have a support network around you um there's nobody you can call to, to turn up and come and help you and you feel a little bit lost. And um, those are just the kind of stories that I really love. I mean, they're my favorite kind of films, my favorite kind of books where people go off on some kind of expedition or some kind of trip and something goes horribly wrong and they're kind of, they're lost in the woods or they're, they're lost at sea or whatever. And, and, I, and I just really enjoy writing those kind of, those kind of stories. I mean, it's it's a it's a fabulous quest novel, you know, without a doubt. And and I love the way you said in the start of our conversation, you know, Aiden really is an everyman. Yeah. You know, he's he's no special powers. He's no, you know, out of the ordinary. Mm. Other than this drive to find this person his sister who means so much to him yeah now, I, I i think I, I think it's not giving anything away if we say that there is you know there's that two-year difference between her first going missing and when yeah. she's sighted um from, yeah. the, from the train window yeah. uh, and i i have to say i found that to be one of the most beautiful moments in the book i mean not somebody's terror at being chased but that the person who sees this Mm. Francesca, the 75-year-old woman who has been down to Los Angeles to, to scatter her husband's ashes. Mm. So a, a very emotional moment of farewell. Yeah. But she's the key 
Yes. You know, and, and you know, as, 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 as a woman of a certain age, you know, Mark, thank you <laughs> for giving, you know, for giving a 75 year old woman that key to then the, the unraveling of what has happened to Scarlett. Yeah. I don't know, the, the, that, that point in that person's history, why did you, why did you choose to have a coming away from something, you know, one of those you know, life moments, one of those difficult life moments? Well, I wanted, I wanted her to be in a state of heightened emotion, I think, mm -hmm. and perception mm -hmm. and, and kind of looking forward to, because she's on the train and she's thinking that she's done this long journey. I mean, for people who haven't read the book, her husband was born in Los Angeles and then he, they, they've spent their lives in Seattle. And his dying wish was that she would make that final journey to Los Angeles by train, which was how he originally came to Seattle. And uh, she's, she's ever so slightly resentful of the fact that he's <laughs> making her do this, this very, very long journey. Because it's a 36 hour train journey. Um, it would be much quicker to fly. <laughs> But she does it because it was his dying wish. And um, and yes, and she's she can't sleep. She's on the she's on she's in her bunk on the train and and um kind of wanders through this this empty train. Well, not, not empty train, but like this quiet train where everybody else is asleep. And so she's the only person who, who witnesses this scene, which happens as dawn breaks through the forest. And I suppose I wanted to. And I knew that people would, would think, oh, she's she's a grieving widow. Has she imagined it? Yeah. yeah. Is it her, all in her imagination? And it's kind of easy for the police to dismiss, to dismiss her when she reports what she's seen. But of course, well, I don't want to give it, she did see something. I don't want to give away what she actually saw. Um and Aidan himself is also skeptical about whether she actually saw Scarlet because it just seems so um, bizarre that this could actually have happened, that she could really have seen his sister. But then again, everybody in Seattle at that time, in the same way that if any of us saw Madeleine McCann now, I mean, I know she's like a much older that we might not recognise because she's older, but someone who looks pretty much the same, we would all recognise them because we've seen their face on TV yeah. and the newspapers and on the internet hundreds of times. So yeah, anybody from Seattle who saw Scarlett would recognize her because she'd been all over the media. And that's what makes him think, well, maybe, maybe it, is, it is her, maybe it is true. And that's why he goes to, to investigate. Mm. But yeah, I'm glad, that, I'm glad that you liked Francesca. I have to say in the original draft, she actually came back into it much more towards the end but the, but when i re when i got through the second third fourth draft she kind of dropped away <laughs> so um yeah um maybe, maybe there, there might be a, there might be an uncut some yeah. some deleted scenes might come out at some point but or yeah. maybe maybe she could you know there could be a book where she reappears and you know you know, this, this idea of, of could it be that Francesca, you know, at 75, you know, you tend to think, well, you know, the amount of life I've lived, but maybe this is just the start of her uh, mm. being this amateur sleuth that... Yeah, a bit like Richard Osman's books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't go there. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. I, you know, I was thinking of a very different kind of character, but there we go. Yeah. There we go. Um but her sighting sets this ball in motion mm. for then this roller coaster of a ride. Um, I, I, I was intrigued as well by the notion of, you know, the, the police, what they've done, what they haven't done, what they don't seem able or don't wish to do, and that, you know, Aiden becomes this, you know, private eye in a way, yeah, amateur yeah. detective. <laughs> Writing the police or not, your choices around that? Mm. Well, to be honest, I didn't do, 
I didn't do like huge amounts of research into what the police in Seattle would have done. I mean, I looked at other missing persons cases. I kind of read up on uh, and on what the FBI or the or the police in Seattle might have might have done. So, for example, they've 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 invest they've they've interviewed. So she was last seen talking to this Nirvana fan in the park. So in the book, this is quite early on, so it's not a spoiler. She goes to visit the park, which is next to the house where Kurt Cobain died, um, which I did when I when I went to Seattle. So I thought I've got to get that into the book because it's such a big, <laughs> such a it's kind of a cinematic scene. It's it's mm. it's quite and it's a very emotional place if you were a Nirvana fan. And um, so she and Aiden go and visit this 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 spot. And this guy comes along and says, um, oh, I'm this tribute, this Nirvana tribute band are playing tonight, you should come along. So he's the first suspect. So they talk to him, they talk to everyone who was at the club. They dredge the lake, they check the, her mobile phone, uh, where it's they, the triangulation of her mobile phone, where it's been. But everything just leads to a dead end. And um, yeah, so. So the cops do their best, but um, two years on, they've made absolutely no progress. And I think that that kind of, that kind of echoes what I was saying before, that if you want to go missing in America, if you kind of know what you're doing, or if the person who's abducted you knows what they're doing, then it's not. So you'll have to keep bringing in these different options because I don't know why I don't want readers to to kind of draw their conclusion I mean I can I, I feel like anyone who starts this book who thinks they know where Scarlett's gone and what's happened will be very surprised by what actually transpires mm -hmm. I think it'd be very hard to guess um what's going to happen in the final third of the book yeah so. I, and and you know, again, that come into the thing of the way you throw in those twists. Mm -hmm. um, nicely done, very nicely done. But we won't go there because we want people to experience those twists. It's vital. It is vital. Um, yeah. Because Aidan isn't the only person looking for a, a missing loved one. Yeah, there's Lana as well. Yeah, and I, I named I after the, the 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 my heroine who's over my shoulder here, Lana Del Rey. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, and I, and I love the dynamic between them. Um, did you enjoy writing this this yeah. dynamic duo? Yeah. Yeah, that I think that's the part of writing this book. I mean, to this. This bit was really, really difficult to write this book. I have to admit, there was a lot of pain, a lot of ripped up pages and deleted scenes and restarts and wrong turns and agony to get it. It took a lot to get it right because I wrote, because when I started it, I knew what was going to happen in the setup, come to the point where Aiden goes to the small town where he starts looking for Scarlet and meets Lana. Um, but where it went from then, I just kept changing, it kept changing. And so among all that agony, the, uh, the relationship between Aiden and Lana and the kind of banter between them, yeah. which I really enjoyed writing. Yeah, um, yeah that, was, that was the most enjoyable part. And to see their relationship develop and I really enjoy writing those kind of will they won't they sort of relationships as well um I know that crime readers can be divided on whether they like romance to creep into their crime novels some people absolutely hate it and some people really enjoy it I personally like it I like um I like to have some kind of romantic element in my books and I would say that there's usually a, a romantic relationship at the heart of all of my books whether they're together as a couple when when the book starts or they meet in the book and then there's that kind of will they won't they get together thing going on it's it's really enjoyable to write and yeah I I that 
Lana kind of teases him a bit and there's some I think there's some quite good jokes in there that yeah. she yeah. comes up with so yeah that was fun that was really good fun to write so, so having said what you've said are you a romantic at heart oh definitely yeah, yeah. absolutely absolutely <laughs> Unashamedly, I would say. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. And you know, again, th this is what I love about this crazy genre that we're mm. mixed up in. That there's space and place for so much. So yeah, you know, there there there, is, there are elements that people don't appreciate. You know, I was thinking, you know, when you spoke about, you know, the the, the horror supernatural elements, some people say, you know, you can't fuse genre. You can't. Mm. I, I think. You know what you should say is it's it's not the thing that I like to read because you can do anything you like. I... Yeah, yeah, and there are there are things I know that there are things in this book that that um, some people love and some people don't. I'm not going to say hate, but some people don't like as much. Uh -huh. So there's a kind of um, again, as, is it veering into spoilerish territory? The bad that the way the bad guys are set up um the organization of the bad guys um and the fact that you've got this this woman who is a very kind of charismatic figure has lots of people following her that's shannon now, yeah shannon yeah now some people would describe that as a cult and when i was writing it i didn't think this is i was like i really don't want people to think this is a cult <laughs> it's more of a political or for me it's meant to be more of a political organization or a an activist organization yes, yeah, like, yeah. Think like Extinction Rebellion. Yes. But the word cult has been used a lot in reviews, like reader reviews. So um, I guess people, I, maybe I should have just leaned into it and thought, okay, maybe it is a cult. Maybe anything with a kind of strong leader. Maybe you could say that Greta Thunberg and all of her followers, that is a cult. It's, I mean, there's there's lots of different ways to, to define it, but... Um, some people love reading about that kind of thing and some people just don't like it and like you say some people like the the more kind of horror supernatural elements coming into crime novels and some people really hate it and think that they should be kept separate and everybody has their own some people like sex scenes in crime novels and some people hate it and there's, so there's all these different quite the only right. thing that people really agree on is that you shouldn't hurt cats and dogs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I realised when I said you can do anything, ah, <clears throat> except that thing. But, 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 but I think what's what is what is at the heart and what is most important is that the author, mm. yourself in this case, but, but, but all those wonderful crime fiction mystery authors out there, is is the need to write what moves you what pleases yeah. you because yeah. if I think if we start saying to our authors you need to be doing this and you need to be doing that mm. then where is the creativity yeah and where is the expression that that yeah. you know that the individual should be bringing to us if, if authors feel straight jacketed yeah I know I know um and I think I set myself rules so for example with the supernatural thing um I my rule is that there is always a rational explanation for yeah. everything that happens. So even in books like uh, The Retreat, where it appears that this house, this, this writer's retreat in the woods in Wales, it appears to be haunted. Or in, in Her Shadow, where you've got this little girl who appears to be talking to her dead aunt and knows all this stuff that she couldn't possibly know. So I often start with those premises and then I have to work out, well, how can this, what's actually going on? And that's often the hard part for me is working out the, the real world explanation for that. I can't, I could never write a book where a ghost did it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It has to, it has to be real. Um, so yeah, so, so I'll, I'll play with horror tropes and I've, I grew up reading horror. I love Stephen King and James Herbert and I watch horror movies, they're like my favourite genre of film. Um, and I kind of use tropes from, from that genre, but always it could really happen in real life. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm just really grateful for the fact that you know you, you make these explorations into how, you know, you want to create a story. Um, this might be yeah, difficult. And... Oh, sorry. Go, no, go ahead, please. I was going to say the monsters in my books are always people. They're real people, and I think that's where I got. That's the starting point. Is that there are, there are terrible bad people out there and they're the they're and usually in my books you have some nice kind of guy who just wants a quiet life he just wants to settle down with his girlfriend or his wife and or his kids or whatever or his cat <laughs> and uh and then someone comes along and and messes it all up and then they have to, and then they get driven to the absolute limit and it's like what would you do if you were an ordinary person thrown into that or pushed into that situation yeah. and yeah so that's for me that's that's the starting point of all of my or nearly all of my books um is I suppose how awful people can be but also how good people can be as well and, and what happens when good people come up against against the bad against the bad yeah, yeah, how, how people be. react, choices that are made. Mm-hmm. You know, I think as well, the, you know, the inclusion of these <coughs> 21st century issues that, you know, that 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 you've woven into the mm. story. You know, I, I very much appreciated that because there are things we do need to be thinking about and how we react and, and whether we get involved. Um, so, you know, thank you again for you know just for the you were talking about the environmental yeah issue. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Be- because you know i think <clears throat> it's really hard isn't it without doubt there are problems there are issues we can make choices in what we do mm. with regard to activism mm. you know p- people who who take positions in the vanguard and very often you know whilst we totally agree that we need to do something, we don't actually like what they're doing because it disturbs our lives. Yeah. It stops us yeah. going about our lives. We don't mind making a noise so long as it doesn't inconvenience us. Mm. Um, I mean, yeah, this is, I mean, the Extinction Rebellion or mm-hmm. the, um, um, what are they called, Insulate Britain, the, the people who fly yeah. down on motorways. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they're very it's very controversial and it's and people super gluing themselves to trains and and stopping people being able to get to work. It's um it's a very risky, very risky strategy for trying to get the public on your side. I mean, God, I remember back in the 80s when you had people like Swampy living up in trees. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that was controversial back then, like the, the kind of green protest that went on in the in the 80s. And um, but what for me, as someone who I mean, to be honest, I don't go on that. I used to go on marches and things when I was a student, like anti anti like BNP marches and things. I don't even know if they were called the BNP then, but whatever they were called before that, the right wing, like fascists. I remember going on this march in London to try and get one of their bookshops closed down or something, and that was quite scary. But um, I, I'm digressing. What, what, um, what interests me is what makes people, well, what, what makes people be prepared to yes. kind of give up their freedom. Yes. Um, to risk going to prison, to risk getting a criminal record and to risk being hated, I suppose, because you care so passionately about this issue. Yes. Now, I'm vegan. Uh, I've been vegetarian for like 30 something years, 35 years, I think now. And then I went vegan a couple, two or three years ago because I felt like it, I, I needed to kind of take that extra step. Mm-hmm especially now that we we were becoming aware of like the environmental impacts of of like dairy farming yeah. and so on uh, and also being vegan is just so much easier now than it used to be so i mean for me without a doubt yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and i drive an electric car but that's no hardship because i've got a really beautiful <laughs> car so, and and i recycle and things but th- those things are very very easy to do and they probably make as an individual i'm making a minimal 
impact. Um, but um, I, I'm fascinated by people who are willing to, to, to really kind of give over their lives for these causes. And that's what a lot, of, some of the characters in this book yes. do. Yeah. And um, yeah, so it was fun to write, to write those characters and to kind of get into those heads of these young people who um, are very politicized. And I've got teenage daughters who are, mm. who are a bit like this, who have, who have issues that they really passionately care about and that, and that they, they, like my daughter went on like the Black Lives Matters marches a couple of years ago when that was when that was happening um and yeah i i loved i honestly love to see it i love to see people get involved in these in these yeah. causes and go and do things that they that they really care about and make their voices heard so um even though i tend to sit at home and and cheer them on from the sidelines but yeah i wanted to get that into a book and maybe that's my small contribution is to, to get people to read this book and go away maybe to finish it maybe thinking about some of these some of these issues yeah yeah I I, I, re I really hope so uh, and and just to chime with what you're saying I, I despite all the doom and gloom I, I, you know I really feel that there's there's hope for the future because like you know with your mm. daughters and the young people that I work with at university, you know. Yeah, this is a great, I think this is a great generation, mm -hmm. Generation Z. They get yes. a lot of bad press. And seeing that their creativity and their passion and their, how aware they are of stuff that we didn't even think about. I'm Generation X. And I'm wearing a Breakfast Club t-shirt, which is probably <laughs> the epitome of the problematic <laughs> film that we that we all just thought was wonderful when it came out in the 80s. But you watch it now and you kind of think, oh my God, what how did we get yeah. how, why did we think that, that was okay? And um yeah, my the the generation coming through now, they they kind of they just get this stuff and they really care about it and and yeah, I think that they've kind of inherited quite a difficult world to live in, but but I, they do give me hope. So yeah, yeah that's a good, yeah. very yeah. positive thing. Without without a doubt, without a doubt. And now I, I'm aware of the time and, and we need to be drawing to a close. And yes. I've loved our discussion around so many things. It's been it's been it's been absolutely wonderful. But we should come back to the book no place to run and and i just wanted to ask you know the the book is out it's a gem of a book but if there were any aspect i sometimes ask authors this if there were any aspect of this book that really makes your heart sing you know and you look at that and you think oh my god did i do that <laughs> Is there an aspect that you can point? You mean to? bits that I would change? No, 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 no. That you think, oh my god, look what I did. That's just fabulous. Oh, okay. You mean <laughs> the best the the thing that I'm proudest of with this book is actually the backstory of the of Shannon, who's my my baddie, my antagonist, and um, again, it's spoilery because it's not revealed until the final third of the book, but. For me, the big challenge of this book was how to kind of get the the environmental issues in without being preach or lectury or yeah. kind of boring yeah. about them. And by seeing all of this stuff through her eyes and her incredibly extreme opinions about things, um, um, it was really important to make her a realistic, relatable character. And so you understand why she is the way that she is. And I think that so there's the the scene in which it's revealed why she became the way that she is i think is the best chapter that i've ever written so i'm i'm really if i could just take that chapter out and and as and use that as an example of my writing that would be the the one that i would be the most the most proud of but you've got to you've got to um I can't say too much because it's it's right near the end of the book. But yeah, that's that's the bit that I was 
was happiest with was Shannon and her her journey and um, and her experiences. And through the many, many drafts, I wrote that quite early on, actually, and through the many drafts of this book that kind of survived through all of the other bits that got <laughs> thrown away or deleted. So for anybody watching, listening, if you haven't read the book yet, or even if you had, take that moment when you get to that point in the story or go back and read that. And just remember what this means to Mark. <laughs> because you know again the building blocks that an author puts together and there are some blocks that you know either have to be wrangled or sadly there are things that get left behind mm. but that, that, that Shannon and her backstory and what that means so thank you for sharing that I appreciate right. that you're welcome well good sir I, 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 I don't wish to detain you any longer um i'm really really grateful that that we finally had a chance to to do this and i'm sorry that that it has taken so long um to get together and talk about your work no need uh, to apologize no yeah need to apologize. just just wish you all the very best thank you um, and yeah i mean a book is already out it's there um no place to run yeah. but i'm sure you're beavering away on something else because that's what yeah i'm i'm on i'm on deadline i've got three weeks to finish the new one and i've still got quite a lot quite a lot to 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 do so i've got i want to try and get it finished for the kids break up for the school holidays excellent, so excellent so yeah got to get on with that now may the force be with you Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and and I look forward to when we can meet actually in person as yes. that's happening these days. So brilliant. Well, all well, the very best and thank you so much. Okay, thank you for having me on. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.